Friends, back in the early 90s, hip-hop group out of New York released, called the Wu-Tang Clan, released an album called The 36 Chambers of Death. And on that album there is a track about various ways that the Wu-Tang Clan would torture people. And some of the stuff that Magor the Cruel does in this last leg of the Magor story kind of reminds you of some of that Wu-Tang torture stuff. I, I, I would reenact the skit word for word, but that would probably get the stream demonetized because the torture is pretty graphic. But those of you who know about the Spike Bat, uh, <laughs> that's right. We're bringing the Magor, the Magor the Cruel came to bring the pain hardcore from the brain to the brain. Got to protect the neck. There's no doubt. <laughs> I've seemed on theme. In any case, we are here. I only see one sunglasses. Yeah, I was joking. I was out late last night. I was out till 4.30. So I said I might have to roll triple sunglasses here. But um, that's a little absurd, isn't it? So we will go with one. I am, uh, would I collaborate with Glidus or Alt Shift X? I'm just sitting here by the phone, pining away for the attention of Glidus and Alt Shift X. Are you, are you kidding? Nah, um, I have chatted with Glidus about collabing. I would love to, uh, me and Glidus are both uh, musicians as well. So we've chatted about music stuff and a few things. He obviously got several months behind on his video, so I'm not sure what all he's got going, but it'll probably happen at some point. Um, what I'd appreciate is if you guys would bug him in his stream and tell him how funny LML is and how we really need to chop it up. That would be great. No, I'm a big fan of those guys. So any chance we can get a series like this about Aegon the Unworthy? Probably so. Um, the next one, so this this Magor the Cruel is basically a reread of Sons of the Dragon, right? So the next one that I was thinking about doing was the Conquest. Same type of thing. Read through the Conquest line by line. See what, uh, harass other streamers. Got it. Uh, politely, Tara, of course. Of course. Um, cajole. A nudge, insinuate. Um, yeah, so the conquest would be one. The conquest has a lot of heavy symbolism too. I would say that most of this mega or the cruel stuff, the story is written mostly for the story. Story, the symbolism in the Magor story seems to be very like piecemeal. Like in a given scene, there'll be a little bit of symbolism, but it doesn't seem like George is constructing the entire narrative as like a long night metaphor, as he did with like say the sworn sword where the entire feud with the two houses is showing us about the others and the Night's Watch. Um, the Magor thing, we haven't done a ton of symbolism because it's, like I said, it's just incidental. It's not really shaping the overall arc of the narrative. The Conquest is different. The Conquest, George has written as more elaborate mythical astronomy in particular. It's showing us, like, the moons and the comets and all kinds of other fun stuff, so... The, uh, the conquest is shorter, a lot shorter than Sons of the Dragon, but it is stuffed with symbolism, so that will be a fun one. Euron content. Well, I, we have a lot of Euron content. Check my Euron playlist. Um, I've, got, I've got live streams. I've got theory videos. Uh, we did a reread of the Euron uh, Winds of Winter chapter. Did a read through of that. And um, Grayways Tim will be back to do some more squisher related stuff too so yeah you're on will, will come it was somebody suggested i do a danny iceberg and i was trying to think if there's enough danny material to do an iceberg there might be i was thinking more of like a targaryen valerian iceberg at first but there might be enough danny stuff in particular i don't know favorite character is danny followed by blood raven uh those are kind of my my folks, I'm a huge Danny Stan, but I just will always emphasize that it's because of her revolutionary nature. Um, there's a lot of hot dragon ladies in the story. Danny is the one who frees the slaves and, you know, upends the unjust order of the world. And that's why I love Danny. So the drowned man, the iron captain, the reaver, good times. Hey, gray waste, Tim. So, but yeah, Blood Raven, I like all the, I can't help but relate to the, the characters like Rhaegar or Blood Raven, or Marwyn the Mage, or Danny and John and Sam, who are like trying to puzzle out 
the old legends and the symbols and the myths and trying to figure out what do we do about the others. That's what gets me the most because that's kind of what I do. So it's kind of like when I watch football, I relate more to the offensive coordinator than the offensive lineman. Um, anyways, so let's get started with Megor part three. This is going to be war against the faith. And uh, there's, as always, trigger warning. It's Megor. It's going to be some violence, some murder, and uh, all kinds of horror. So with that said, any other announcements I should make? Um, like, like the stream, subscribe to the channel. Mo Kalen video is coming along. And uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I did the um, White Walker icebergs on Sunday and Monday, so I kind of relaxed this week. The chat is frozen on the screen. Thank you. Let's fix that. Despicable. Despicable. Thank you, though. Thank you, Lonk the Lunk, for staying on top of it. So, yeah, I, I didn't do a Friday stream. I thought I'd let y'all catch up with the icebergs. Uh, I'm not sure what we'll do next weekend, but we'll be back in full effect to have Grey Waste Tim back. Grey Waste Tim is itching to do the Sisterton Davos chapter it's got some borels and some squisher stuff so that'll be coming soon in any case mythic concepts i am cdn i am yes i am i kind of backburnered it because i put out a video and it didn't do nothing and i needed to keep the income coming so i've been focusing on this channel but yes i've got that harap and seals video which is the whole reason i made the channel that's the next one thanks for asking Davos dinner with a deep one. That'll be the title, Tim. All right, so late in the year, <clears throat> 45 AC, folks. Let me clear my throat real quick. King Magor took the field once again to continue his war against the outlawed remnants of the faith militant, leaving Queen Tyanna to rule King's Landing together with the new hand, Lord Edwell Celtigar. That should go fine. What could go wrong? In the great woods south of the Blackwater, which is the King's Wood, the King's forces hunted down scores of poor fellows who had taken refuge there. So shades of, well, see, who's hidden the King's Wood before? Um, the uh, King's Wood Brotherhood, which is a Robin Hood parallel. And then, of course, um, Tyrion's mountain clans that he brings from the Vale after the Battle of the Blackwater. They just sort of take up living in the King's Wood. So it's, it's a good place to live. Uh, so, uh, yeah, they're in the King's Wood, those poor fellows, um, sending many to the wall. So, right, the King's forces are hunting them down, sending many to the wall and hanging those who refuse to take the black. Their leader, the woman known as Poxy Jane Poor, continued to elude the king until at last she was betrayed by three of her own followers who received pardons and knighthoods as their reward. Oh, there's a little symbolism. <laughs> So we've already identified uh, Poxy Jane as a Nissa Nissa figure with the pox being the moon crater symbolism layer. Uh, she's taking up residence in the wood as Nissa Nissa does. And then the interesting thing to note here is that she is betrayed. Um, and we have seen symbolism where there is often a green man figure that's almost looks like he's sailing out Nissa Nissa to Azor High. And the one I always go to for an example of that is uh, Arya, the golden squirrel. Think of the children of the forest as squirrel people and Nissa Nissa as a child of the forest. Arya is the golden squirrel because she has so much value. And uh, Greenbeard brings her to Beric, with Beric being an Azor High figure and Greenbeard, the Tyroshi, obviously being uh, a green-skinned Garth figure. So you've got this green man surrendering up Nissa Nissa to Azor Hot. And we've seen that a few times. So that's that could be some sort of betrayal from the Green Men. <laughs> Kelly Johnson, <laughs> always asking about the GEOTD. Um, the High Towers, it's, it's an unknown. I suspect they have some memories, though. They've got old books up in that high tower. They have treasures and wonders. The high tower, 
the Citadel is kind of like just a giant black box, or all of Old Town, you might say. George can hide anything he wants. Any bit of Valerian lore, any magical artifact, anything at all, could be up in the High Tower or in the Citadel. So, I don't have specific guesses, but you're right to think about it, Kelly. It literally could, could be anything up in there. Oh, I got some PayPals. Thanks, guys. From Andrew and Dalton. You're very welcome, guys. Hey, Devoted. Nice to see you. And it is 420. Yep. I praised before I came on. Truth be told, Schrodinger's library. I mean, it is going to get burned, but it's what will, what kind of artifacts will George, uh, you know, shake loose before that happens. So Poxy Jane Poor, betrayed by three of her own followers. Three septons traveling with his grace declared Poxy Jane a witch. And Magor ordered her to be burned alive in a field beside the Wendwater. When the day appointed for her execution came, 300 of her followers, poor fellows and peasants all, burst from the woods to rescue her. The king had anticipated this, however, and his men were ready for the attack. So this is really, they used the execution of Jane to flush out poor fellows then. It was a trap. Give me the it's a trap emojis. The... Um, so the rescuers were surrounded and slaughtered among the last to die was their leader, who proved to be Sir Horace Hill, the bastard hedge knight who had escaped the carnage at the Great Fork three years earlier. This time he proved less fortunate. So more symbolism, of course. The idea of burning a Nissa Nissa figure at the stake is just turning her into a burning tree, which is a symbol of the weirwood, um, as well as a cruel execution as well. But yeah, it's a... A fiery tree death is what that is. And yes, Joan of Arc parallels, I guess. Love the flannel you're representing my culture. Our culture, devoted. We as people old enough not to say our exact ages celebrate the flannels. <laughs> um, so, okay. Elsewhere in the realm, however, the tide of the times had begun to turn against the king. Small folk and lords alike had come to despise him for his many cruelties, and many began to give help and comfort to his enemies. And this is kind of the thing that we were saying about being overly cruel. <laughs> anyway, um, that sound is the sound of more PayPals. That's a happy sound. Let's see who it was. From Kelly, J <laughs> Kelly Johnson. Why don't show high towers look Valerian? Because they're not down. That's the deep lore, dude. That's the deep lore. And really, the show needed to make the high towers look different than all the Targaryens. It's more a service of making the show easy to understand for the viewer, Kelly Johnson. Because they're not going to do anything with the Great Empire, the Dawn stuff, in House of the Dragon. So they didn't need to really do that. And plus, the idea that the High Towers look Valerian is pretty, it's only based on a couple of descriptions, and it's very ambiguous. So we're waiting for more High Towers before we can really conclude that they still have Valerian looks. They might have different looks, because the Great Empire of the Dawn did have different looks. I am 32. The PayPal link is in the description of the video, and I'm not 32, that's a lie. Mentally, I'm 32. So, uh, I think this tea is about ready. Let me pull this. Hang on. Huh. Speaking of being old and being mentally 32, I was out till <laughs> mentally 32 is also a lie. Hey, I was out till 4.30 a.m. drum and basing at a warehouse party. I'll have you know. Not dead yet. <laughs> yeah. I am, however, a bit tired. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've been told not to slurp my tea into the microphone. Polite, politely asked. Politely asked. I'm not 32. It's such a lie. Uh, okay, so...
Septon Moon. The high Septon raced up by the poor fellows. And I do have my glowing moon turned on today. Septon Moon. Um, he roused the poor fellows against the man in Old Town they called the High Lickspittle, who, you know, went along with Magor and crowned Magor. Roamed the riverlands and the reach at will, drawing huge crowds whenever he emerged from the woods to preach against the king. The hill country north of the Golden Tooth was ruled in all but name by the Red Dog, Sir Joffrey Doggett, self-proclaimed Grand Captain of the Warrior's Sons. Neither Casterly Rock nor River Run seemed inclined to move against him. Dennis the Lame and Ragged Silas remained at large, and wherever they roamed, small folk helped keep them safe. Knights and men-at-arms sent out to bring, bring them to justice, oft vanished. So this is... <clears throat> yeah, emerging from the woods like the others, Sept and Moon. Others have moon symbolism. This is really a very, uh, I think George loves writing this sort of Robin Hood stuff. This sort of like, hashtag small folk, small rebellions against the crown. He's just showing you like, when the High Lords don't do a good job, treason spring up like weeds. Like people will grow restless and they'll do all kinds of stuff, so... Hmm. All right. In 46 AC, King Magor returned to the Red Keep with 2,000 skulls, the fruits of a year of campaigning. They were the heads of poor fellows and warrior sons, he announced, and as he dumped them out beneath the Iron Throne, uh, as he dumped them out beneath the Iron Throne, but it was widely believed that many of the grizzly trophies belonged to simple crofters, field hands, and swine herds, guilty of no crime but faith. And probably the line between those things is blurry because at times the poor fellows are being hidden and helped by the common folk. And many of the common folk might join the poor fellows and then leave. So, yeah, Magor probably killed all kinds of people. And here is, um, I've got a picture of this, the skulls around the throne. So let me just pull that up. It's actually the one we used for the title for the first, the first one. Oh no, no, that isn't it. I'm sorry. I take it back. That was him being crowned. There was the high septon behind him. This is the one. And this is by Bastien Lecouf de Harm. So you can see there the pile of skulls. It's actually pretty sick artwork. I'll leave that up for just a second. I'll get rid of this and put this up here. Like that. Boom. Um, so the coming of the new year found Magor still without a son, nor even a bastard who might be legitimized. Nor did it seem, and they're making that point just to show you, like, Magor's not having kids by anybody. Nor did it seem likely that the Queen Tyanna would give him the heir that he desired, while she continued to serve his grace as mistress of whisperers, the king no longer sought her bed. I guess I could put that on vibrate. Thank you very much, though. That is awesome of you guys. And let me just get rid of that. Thank you, Braley. So it was past time for him to take a new wife. Magor's counselors agreed. I mean, he's only got one. It's kind of threadbare. But they parted ways on who that wife should be. Grand Maester Benefer suggested a match with the proud and lovely Lady of Starfall, Clarice Dane. Cla it's C-L-A-R. I guess it's Clarice. Yeah, Clarice. <laughs> Shout out. Sounds of the Lambs. Clarice Dane, in the hopes of detaching her lands and house from Dorne. Oh, interesting. Okay. Alton Butterwell, Master of Coin. And, of course, this is in the, in the third Duncan Egg book. Clarissa Issa. Yeah, totally. Lady of Starfall. That's pretty good. 
Nissa explains it all. Coming on Nickelodeon. So Alton Butterwell, this is going to be like the grandfather of Lord Butterwell from the Mystery Night. And remember, they have that dragon's egg. He's going to acquire that dragon's egg in the course of the story. So keep your eye on Alton Butterwell. Um, Master of Coin offered his widowed sister, a stout woman with seven children. Though admittedly no beauty, he argued, her fertility had been proved beyond a doubt. The king's hand, Lord Celtigar, had two young maiden daughters, 13 and 12 years of age, respectively. He urged the king to take his pick of them or marry both if he preferred. Lord Celtigar, who knows Magor uh, at this point and like what he's about. Yikes. That's a big fat yikes from Lord Celtigar. Jeez. 12 and... Okay, just didn't want to gloss over that. This is the Game of Thrones. Like, this is what it's about. This is what it's about. We saw it on the TV show, too. The Valarions did it with their daughter. Obviously, Viserys, not quite Magor, but he was 50 and, like, rotting and shit. So, I mean... It's... Ugh. At least we don't live in a world, a world with arranged marriages. Um... I guess I shouldn't say that. Mostly. Most of us do. Moving in that direction. Okay, so... Lord Celtigar. Um, Lord Valarion of Driftmark advised Magor to send for his niece Reyna, the widow of Aegon the Uncrowned. And remember, she's out uh, staying with the, the Farmans, I think, at this point. By taking her to wife, Magor could unite their claims, prevent any fresh rebellions from gathering around her, and acquire a hostage against any plots her mother, Queen Alyssa, might foment. So remember, Alyssa is Aenys' wife. So Reyna is the older sister of Jaehaerys and Alysanne. And Magor's niece, yeah. Um, I missed, like, everything. What did I miss? Oh, somebody else. All right. And let's see here. Ooh. They come one or two, one or two more Garth praisings away from having these pipes loosened up here. We'll get there. We'll get there. Um, arranged egg babies? What are you talking about? Oh, eggs children. Yeah. Okay, so... King Magor listened to each man in turn. Though in the end he scorned most of the women they put forward, some of the reasons and arguments took root in him. He would have a woman of proven fertility, he decided, though not Butterwell's fat and homely sister. He would, <laughs> Thanks, maesters. He would take more than one wife, as Lord Celtigar urged. Two wives would double his chance of getting a son. Three wives would triple it. And one of those wives should surely be his niece. There was wisdom in Lord Valerion's counsel. Queen Alyssa and her two youngest children remained in hiding. It was thought that they had fled across the narrow sea to Tyrosh, or perhaps Volantis. But they still represented a threat to Magor's crown, and any son he might father. Taking Aeneas's daughter to wife would weaken any claims put forward by her younger siblings. After the death of her husband and her flight to Fair Isle, Reyna Targaryen had acted quickly to protect her daughters. If Prince Aegon had truly been the king... By law, his eldest daughter, Araya, stood his heir, and might therefore uh, claim to be the rightful queen of the Seven Kingdoms. But Araya and her sister Rayella were barely a year old, and Reyna knew that to trumpet such claims would be tantamount to condemning them to death. Instead, she dyed their hair, changed their names, and sent them from her, entrusting them to certain powerful allies who would see them fostered in good homes by worthy men who would have no inkling of their true identities. Even their mother must not know where the girls were going, the princess insisted. What she did not know, she could not reveal, even under torture. So that's, that's a pretty... Basically giving away your children. 
with, and you might not even be able to find them again, but it's the best thing you can do for their safety. Like that's a crazy choice to have to make. So that's how, that's how dire things are. Wow. That's intense. It also doesn't work. <laughs> One second here. What YouTube can't see, they can't demonetize. So no such escape was possible for Raina Targaryen herself. Though she could change her name, dye her hair, and garb herself in a tavern wench's rough spun, or the robes of a septa, there was no disguising her dragon, that's true. Dreamfire was a slender, pale blue she-dragon with silvery markings. He had already produced two clutches of eggs, and Raina had been riding her since the age of twelve. And let's, uh, let's do give Reyna some art time. Sorry, I didn't have the art pulled ahead of time, guys. I do apologize. Got a lot of Reyna, though. Let's see here. That's the one I'm looking for. I have a bunch of Raina artwork because I've done videos uh, with her, so I had to sort of look, find it all. So I will just move this over here. We'll go through this real quick, just to sort of um, introduce the character, because she's gonna play a big role in this last part. So. Here is uh, Reyna Targaryen with Dreamfire. Uh, obviously, it doesn't look like the right color, but this is like sunset, so it looks like everything is sort of colored red. But if we will um, pardon the tint, it's a pretty awesome piece of artwork. And this is by um, Hazem Amin. Reyna Targaryen, the Queen in the East. So this is these are the Black Brides that we're about to read about. Um, there's Jane Westerling and Eleanor Costain, and obviously Raina in the lower right. And this artist is Kieran Yanner. So this is really awesome, like very medieval portrait style. This is from uh, Rise of the Dragon, both of those last two. So this is Joshua Kairos. Um, we'll get here. These are Lannisters and Reyna. The Lannisters, in no uncertain terms, hint that they want a dragon's egg as a gift. We'll get to that. This is Reyna um, en route to King's Landing by Joshua Kairos with Tiny Dreamfire. This is Older Reyna by High Laura. This is... Um, uh, Magali Villanueva from the original World of Ice and Fire, Black Brides, that's uh, Reyna. Here is Reyna with Dreamfire. There's a couple of Dreamfires here. Star Dragon Slayer is the artist. Love this one. This one captures the mood of Reyna, I feel. Oh, the last picture was Damon's daughter, Reyna. No, not this one. No, that's Dreamfire. Um, this one, um, maybe it's always possible. There's a few Reynas, it's always possible. So, yeah, this is very Reyna Targaryen. <laughs> this is her unfair isle, just sort of like uh, rolling her eyes at all this shit. <laughs> so, this is cool. This is um, Reyna meeting Dreamfire by Art by Val. So this is uh, this is twelve year old Reyna. Actually, no, riding since twelve. I think they would have met earlier, so maybe she's like seven here. Need a few years to grow to riding size, obviously. 
This is by Caffeine 2. So here's Raina with Baby Dream Fire. Here is uh, also Caffeine 2. Oh, this is Morning. So this is Raina. Okay. So this is Raina Damon's daughter who had the dragon Morning. Very good. And this is Raina with Dreamfire. Yeah. There you go. So, and this is also uh, Raina and Dreamfire, obviously. This is the one I've used a bunch. And this is by um, Nika Minoru. And then this one here is by Samantha Altarazi. Pretty dope. Extra fantasy fairy fey reina with dream fire. Seems, feels right. Feels right. Yeah, this is a good one. All right, let me uh, shrink this back up and go back to the text. And we'll go with, uh, we'll go with that one. So Dreamfire already produced two clutches of eggs and Raina had been riding her since she was 12. So dragons are not easily hidden. Instead, the princess took them both as far from Magor as she could to Fair Isle, where Mark Farman granted her the hospitality of Fair Castle with its tall white towers rising high above the sunset sea. And there she rested, reading, praying, wondering how long she would be given before her uncle sent for her. Raina never doubted that he would, she said afterward. It was a question of when, not if. The summons came sooner than she would have liked, though not as soon as she might have feared. There was no question of defiance. That would only bring down the king, or bring the king down on Fair Isle with Balerion. Raina had grown fond of Lord Farman, and more than fond of his second son, Andro. She would not repay their kindness with fire and blood. She mounted Dreamfire and flew to the Red Keep, where she learned that she must marry her uncle, her husband's killer. And there, as well, Raina met her fellow brides, for this was to be a triple wedding. So this is, okay. We made the point, Magor's cruelty makes it so that people don't want, they can't, uh, they can't um, yield to him. They can't make treaties with him. They can't expect him to honor any of his word. Well, the flip side of that is that when you're spineless like Aenys, your words mean nothing. Your commands mean nothing. When you've taken your dragon out and burned a few things, it, it's different when you, you know, issue a summons to somebody. So this is, we see this at play too. This is Aenys' weakness. His lack of willingness to use his dragon mean that people just shrugged off his orders. But when Magor says, come to King's Landing, you know it, he means it. So, there is that. Just to be fair. Because we're obviously, we're evaluating Magor not just from a moral perspective, from also like a political perspective. Because morally, it's pretty easy to say, not a very nice guy. What we're really trying to get into is like, his political decisions, which some of them were they smart, some of them were they cruel and insane. Uh, and that's a lot of what we've been trying to hash out, so... Triple wedding. Mm, man. Lady Jane of House Westerling had been married to Alan Tarbeck, who had died with Prince Aegon in the battle beneath the god's eye. A few months later, she had given her late lord a posthumous son. Tall and slender with lustrous brown hair, Lady Jane was being courted by a younger son of the Lord of Casterly Rock when Magor sent for her, but this meant little and less to the king. <laughs> yeah, he did not care. More troubling was the case of Lady Eleanor of House Costain, the wife of Sir Theo Balling, a landed knight who had fought for the king in his last campaign against the poor fellows. Though only 19, Lady Eleanor had already given Balling three sons, when the king's eye fell upon her. Sounds a little I have Sauron like. The youngest boy was still at her breast when Sir Theo was arrested by the king's guard and charged with conspiring with Queen Alyssa 
to murder the king and place the boy Jaehaerys on the Iron Throne. Though Balling protested his innocence, he was found guilty and beheaded the same day. King Magor gave his widow seven days to mourn in honor of the gods, then summoned her to tell her they would marry. So, that's... Honestly, okay. So this... This does remind me of King David and Bathsheba. And this has to be an influence here. Which is interesting because someone else mentioned the idea that, like, Magor is actually, like, a really weird and messed up King Solomon with his building of the Red Keep. And a couple other things. And so here we see this David and Bathsheba echo where it's the same thing. King David... You know, he, he uh, lusts after Bathsheba, who is married to a soldier. And so he puts that soldier on the front line so that he dies in war. And then he marries Bathsheba. And uh, I believe it's Samuel, who is the high prophet at that time. He comes and condemns David in his court in no uncertain terms. And then David weeps and writes his most, like, depraved psalm, you know, about how awful he is and all this stuff. So... Definitely, uh, the chat is frozen. It seems like an echo. Thank you. Yeah, there's lots of Bible stuff in here. So at the town of Stony Sept, Septon Moon denounced King Magor's wedding plans, and hundreds of town folk cheered wildly, but few others dared to raise their voices against his grace. The High Septon took ship at Old Town, sailing to King's Landing to perform the marriage rites. So we've come a long way from the old position of the faith. Um, on a warm spring day in the 47th year after the conquest, Magor Targaryen took three wives in the ward of the Red Keep, though each of his new queens was garbed and cloaked in the colors of her father's house. The people of King's Landing called them the Black Brides, for all three were widows. Yeah. So, there's that. <laughs> the presence of Lady Jane's son and Lady Eleanor's three boys at the wedding ensured that they would play their parts in the ceremony, but there were many who expected some show of defiance from Princess Reyna. Such hopes were quelled when Queen Tyanna appeared escorting two young girls with silver hair and purple eyes, clad in the red and black of House Targaryen. You were foolish to think you could hide them from me, Tyanna told the princess. Raina bowed her head and spoke her vows in a voice as cold as ice. So definitely some shades of Nissa Nissa, Night's Queen, being forced to marry against her will, vows as cold as ice. Reminds us of Stoneheart's voice, cold as ice, the other's voices, like the cracking of ice on a winter lake. Yeah, it's definitely, uh, definitely a brutal move, but this is the thing about having a sorceress at your side. It's, it's mostly a good thing to have. Or a sorcerer, like Blood Raven. So many queer and contradictory stories are told of the night that followed. <laughs> And with the passage of so many years, it's difficult to separate truths from legends. Did the three black brides share a single bed, as some claim? It seems unlikely. Did His Grace visit all three women during the night and consummate all three unions? Perhaps. Did Princess Reyna attempt to kill the king with a dagger concealed beneath her pillows, as she later claimed? Did Eleanor Costain scratch the king's back to bloody ribbons as they coupled? Did Jane Westerling drink the fertility potion the Queen Tyana supposedly brought her? or throw it in the older woman's face. Was such a potion ever mixed or offered? The first account of it does not appear until well into the reign of King Jaehaerys, 20 years after both women were dead. <clears throat> this we know. In the aftermath of the wedding, Magor declared Reyna's daughter Araya his lawful heir, quote, until such time as the gods grant me a son, while sending her twin, Rayella to Old Town to be raised as a septa. His nephew Jaehaerys, the rightful heir by all the laws of the Seven Kingdoms, was expressly disinherited in the same decree. 
Queen Jane's son was confirmed as Lord of Tarbeck Hall and sent to Casterly Rock to be raised as a ward of Lyman Lannister. Queen Eleanor's elder boys were similarly disposed of, one to the Erie, one to Highgarden. The queen's youngest babe was turned over to a wet nurse, and the king found the queen's nursing irksome. As the king found the queen's nursing irksome. Stupid biology. Half a year later, Edwell Seltigar, he of the take both of my teenage daughters, Magor, fame, the king's hand announced that Queen Jane was with child. Hardly had her belly begun to swell when the king himself revealed that Queen Eleanor was also pregnant. Magor showered both women with gifts and honors and granted new lands and offices to their fathers, brothers, and uncles. But his joy proved to be short-lived. How nervous are you getting a gift from Magor? Like, really, you just don't want the guy to pay attention to you at all. Those are not gifts that you savor. Oh, man. Three moons before she was due, Queen Jane was brought to bed by a sudden onset of labor pains and was delivered of a stillborn child as monstrous as the one Alice Haraway had birthed. A legless and armless creature possessed of both male and female genitalia. Shout out Baphomet! Yes! Happy Pride Month! Baphomet rules! Anyway, it is a Baphomet shout out. And also one thinks of the idea that dragons may not have gender, or maybe they switch gender, they're not sure. The only way that anyone knows which dragons are she-dragons are by the ones that lay eggs. And there do seem to be some dragons that consistently lay eggs. But it is an issue of some confusion. So, And the Targs are kind of androgynous. So, just, there you go. We've got our second lizard baby is the point. And Magor was cursed, men said. He had slain his nephew, made war against the faith and the high septon, defied the gods, committed murder and incest, adultery and rape. His privy parts were poisoned, his seed full of worms, and the gods would never grant him a living son. Or so the whispers ran. Magor himself settled on a different explanation and sent Sir Owen Bush and Sir Maladon Moore to seize Queen Tyanna and deliver her to the dungeons. There, the Pentashi queen made a full confession. Even as the king's torturers readied their implements, she had poisoned Jane Westerling's child in the womb, just as she had Alice Haraway's. It would be the same with Eleanor Costain's whelps, she promised. It is said that the king slew her himself, cutting out her heart with black fire and feeding it to his dogs. But even in death, Tyana of the Tower had her revenge, for it came to pass just as she had promised, the moon turned and turned again, and in the black of night, Queen Eleanor, too, was delivered of a malformed and stillborn child, an eyeless, an eyeless boy, born with rudimentary wings. So let, let's go back to the artwork, because somebody had to draw this. And it was once again, Kieran Yanner. And here is the death of Tyana. I would just let you check on that for a half second. Yeah, that's actually, that's obviously not Blackfire. That is a little small. Yeah, Blackfire shrunk in the, uh, in Aegon's funeral pyre. That was, that's it. I'll get Cleo in a minute. 
I like Megan her weight. She gets pushy if you know if you just do whatever she wants. That's called uh instead of black fire, it's like black spark, black black kindling. I don't know. It's a knife. That's not a knife. I mean, it's pretty big for a knife. Anyway, Joy. He's a grower, not a shower. Gray waste, Tim. <laughs> I thought you were too busy to join me on this stream. You liar. <laughs> uh, all right, that was in the 48th year after the conquest, the sixth year after King Magor's reign. The sixth year of King Magor's reign, which is the last. Uh, and the last year of his life. So we're getting close to the end. Like I said, no man in the seven kingdoms could doubt that the king was accursed now. What follows, uh, what followers still remained to him began to melt away, evaporate, evaporating like dew in the morning sun. Word reached King's Landing that Sir Joffrey Doggett had been seen entering River Run, not as a captive, but as a guest of Lord Tully. Septon Moon appeared once more, leading thousands of the faithful on a march across the reach to Old Town, with the announced intent of bearding the Lickspittle in the Starry Sept to demand that he denounce the abomination on the Iron Throne, and lift his ban on the military orders. When Lord Oakhart and Lord Rowan appeared before him with their levies, they came not to attack Moon, but to join him. Lord Celtigar resigned his king's hand and returned to his seat on Claw Isle, where his daughters gave him a really hard time, I hope. Ugh. Um, let's see. Reports from the Dornish marches suggested that the Dornishmen were gathering in the passes preparing to invade the realm. The worst blow came from Storm's End. There on the shores of Shipbreaker Bay, Lord Rogar Baratheon proclaimed young Jaehaerys Targaryen uh, to be the true and lawful king of the Andals, the Roinar, and the First Man titles titles. And Prince Jaehaerys named Lord Rogar protector of the realm and hand of the king. The prince's mother, Queen Alyssa, and his sister, Alysanne, stood beside him as Jaehaerys unsheathed dark sister and vowed to end the reign of his usurping uncle. A hundred banner lords and Stormland knights cheered their proclamation. King Jaehaerys was 14 years old when he claimed the throne, a handsome youth, skilled with lance and longbow, and a gifted rider. More, he rode a great bronze and tan beast called Vermithor, and his sister Alysanne, a maid of twelve, commanded her own dragon, Silverwing, Megor has only one dragon, Lord Rogar told the Stormlands. Our prince has two. And soon three, when word reached the Red Keep that Jaehaerys was gathering his forces at Storm's End. Raina Targaryen mounted Dreamfire and flew to join him, abandoning the uncle she had been forced to wed. She took her daughter Araya and Blackfire, stolen from the king's own scabbard as he slept. And that's why Reyna is a badass. I mean, that's, that's, that's sick right there. So let me get, uh, I think I have some, of, I think I might have the Jaehaerys, young Jaehaerys artwork that'll give us an idea of what we're talking about. Jaehaerys with two AEs, of course. Here's Jerry's crowning, bedding, wedding. All right. So we've got it. Yeah, we've got a couple of these scenes here. So this is 14. This is Jerry's being crowned by the High Septum. We're not quite there yet. But that's about the right age. And you see Alisanne right behind him. Uh, here's the bedding of Jaehaerys and Alisanne. This will be two years later. 16 and 15, I think. Here's them as adults by Chili Raven Art. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. This is by Doug Wheatley. Uh, also Doug Wheatley. This is the one that we just saw. This is him being proclaimed king by Rogar Baratheon um, with his mother, Alyssa, and his uh, sister wife, Alysanne. So, and there's Silverwing and Vermithor. I'm not sure if they're quite that big yet, but 
You'd think she'd take the scabbard too, Tara says. Yeah, pulling it out of the scabbard's really noisy. Well, the idea is that like he was sleeping with the sword in his scabbard, so you can't take his belt off. So she literally pulled the sword out of the sheath while he was sleeping, or maybe it was like leaned up against the bed. So it was definitely a sick theft from Reyna there. So King Magor's response was sluggish and confused. He commanded the Grand Maester to send forth his ravens, summoning all his leal lords and bannermen to gather at King's Landing, only to find that Benefer had taken ship for Pentos. Oops. Yikes. Finding Princess Araya gone, he sent a rider to Old Town to demand the head of her twin sister Rayella to punish their mother for her betrayal. Lord Hightower imprisoned his messenger instead. Two of his king's guard vanished one night to go over to Jaehaerys, and Sir Owen Bush was found dead outside a brothel, his members stuffed in his mouth. Owen Bush, let's see, he carried out some of Magor's cruelty a couple pages ago. Let's go back. See the one that arrested one of the wives' husband or something like that? Let's see. No, it wasn't bawling. He did something. Okay, well, I do not want to tarry. However, it's definitely one of Magor's henchmen getting his comeuppance. So, sorry about that. <laughs> sorry about that. What the member stuffed in the mouth. Lord Valarion of Driftmark was amongst the first to declare for Jaehaerys. As the Valarions were the realm's traditional admirals, Magor woke to find he had lost the entire royal fleet. Oops. The Tyrells of Highgarden followed with all the power of the Reach. The High Towers of Old Town. The Red Wines of the Arbor. Um, the Lannisters of Casterly Rock. Oh, I got the picture too big. The Aarons... The Arons of the Eerie, the Royces of Runestone, one by one they came out against the king. The chat is frozen. Why does this keep happening? Thanks, guys. Blood Raven is censoring the chat again. Yeah, just like I said, I'm, I'm keeping an eye on it, so let me know. And uh, let's see. In King's Landing, a score of lesser lords gathered at Magor's command, amongst them Lord Darklin of Duskendale, Lord Massey of Stone Dance, Lord Towers of Hare and Hall, Lord Staunton of Rook's Rest, Lord Bar Aemon Sharp, Bar Aemon of Sharp Point, Lord Buckwell of the Antlers, uh, Lord Rosby, Stokeworth, Hayfords. These are all places close to King's Landing, like the first places that he could go burn with Balerion, essentially. These are the people that are like, oh yeah, no, I'm still, you know, I'm down with Magor. Magor brought them together in the Red Keep one night to discuss his plan. Oh, I skipped one, sorry. Um, yet they commanded scarce 4,000 men against them all, and only one in 10 of those were knights. So yeah, these these lords, um, it's not top chat, live chat thing. It's just some sort of thing with the streaming platform. Sometimes it happens like once a stream, and sometimes it happens three or four times. But I don't know what's... It's a new problem, so I haven't figured it out yet. So, yeah, these these uh, houses that are close to King's Landing, they don't have tons and tons of soldiers. So this is very desperate. So Magor brought them together in the Red Keep one night to discuss his plan of battle when they saw how few they were and realized that no great lords were coming to join them. Many lost heart, and Lord Hayford went so far as to urge his grace to abdicate and take the black. Night King status. His grace ordered Hayford beheaded on the spot, and continued the war council with his lordship's head, mounted on a lance behind the Iron Throne. So he's Magor to the end, if you will. And I suppose that could be a calumny, but again, it's a lot of people in the room, so I tend to think that's true. Magor does not hesitate to cut people's heads off. So, I mean, if you're stuck on that, like, I don't think Magor really was beheading people. Like, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you about that. <laughs> he definitely liked to behead people. 
So all day, the Lord's, it's very sudden and final, and that suits his personality. You know, he's like, the high septon objects, he doesn't say a word, he just cuts his head off. That's, that's, his, that's his MO. Modus operandi. So all day, the Lord's made plans, and late into the night, and the head grew stinkier. It was the hour of the wolf when at last Magor allowed them to take their leave. The king remained behind, brooding on the iron throne as they departed. Lord Towers and Lord Rosby were the last to see his grace. Hours later, as dawn was breaking, the last of Magor's queens came seeking after him. Queen Eleanor found him still upon the Iron Throne, pale and dead. And here we'll go back to the... Uh... This is by Mark Simonetti. So, pale and dead, his robes soaked through with blood. His arms had been slashed open from wrist to elbow on jagged barbs, and another blade had gone through his neck to emerge beneath his chin. And you can see that on the picture. And here's uh, the Doug Wheatley version. Many to this day believe it was the Iron Throne itself that killed him. Magor was alive when Rosby and Towers left the throne room, they argue, and the guards at the doors swore that no one entered afterward until Queen Eleanor made her discovery. Some say it was the queen herself who forced him down onto those barbs and blades to avenge the murder of her first husband. The king's guard might have done the deed, though that would have required them to act in concert, as there were two knights posted at each door. It might also have been a person or persons unknown, entering and leaving the throne room through some hidden passage. The Red Keep has its secrets, known only to the dead, and also anyone who worked for Tyana of the Tower. So, that's who I would suspect. Um, let's see here. It might also be that the king tasted despair in the dark watches of the night and took his own life, twisting the blades as needed and opening his veins to spare himself the defeat and disgrace that surely awaited him. The reign of King Magor I Targaryen, known to history and legend as Magor the Cruel, lasted six years and sixty-six days. Upon his death, his corpse was burned in the yard of the Red Keep, his ashes interred afterward on Dragonstone, beside those of his mother. He died childless and left no heir of his body. And I got a couple of new PayPal's. Please shout out my wife, Jennifer Davis. She loves your content and watches all your live streams. Jennifer Davis, your husband loves you. Cheers. And Kelly Johnson, all them women, and he just didn't want to face the facts that he was firing blanks. Worse than blanks, Kelly Johnson. Worse than blanks. So let's, we'll go back to the Tyana. So this, one of the major questions is what was going on with Tyana and his kids. So we'll go back to that in a second. Where were, where, um, where are these cowardly great lords when Aegon needed them to support his claim? Yeah, the Aegon with Quicksilver. So here's, that's a good discussion point. Okay, so we'll take on that one first. So when Aegon tried to take the throne, he did not time it well. Um, he was seen as weak already because he was hemmed up in the Riverlands for a long time. Um, he did not ride his dragon for a long time because he didn't have one. And he didn't let his wife bring his dragon. So he's not well established as a dragon lord. Didn't have the backing of high lords. And might not have even had the backing of his wife when he went to that last battle. Um, he was ignoring advice. And he just didn't time it very well. Compare that to how Jaehaerys and Alysanne were kept basically by his mother, Alyssa. She took them off the board and bided time until their dragons were big enough until they were 14 and until Magor was weak. And then they made their move. And that's why it worked. So yeah, the, the High Lords shouldn't be looked to for courage. It's all about checking the wind and seeing which way the political winds are blowing. So when Magor had power, Old Town and other High Lords had to go along with him because that was just the best decision at the time. But then as soon as he was weak, 
Everyone abandoned him and looked for a better candidate when one presented itself. And this, in the end, is kind of the verdict on cruelty as a political governing tool. It's just, you're playing whack-a-mole. You know, you're constantly trying to suppress treason and rebellion. You know, we could say treason, but it's, you know, there's such a thing as the... Uh, There's a phrase for it. It's it's the duty that a king owes his people. And um, essentially it just means that, you know, anyone in power, anyone who's going to be a ruler will tend to stay in power if they do a good job and provide safety and security and prosperity. And if they don't, social contract, thank you. And if they don't, then people will rise up and overthrow them. It's just inherent law of nature. If someone's repressing you, you're going to get pissed off and get your pitchfork. So, yeah, I mean, you see it played out here. George is kind of, it's almost, this is why I'm baffled when people sort of get stuck on this. It's like George gives us Aegon and Jaehaerys and Alisanne on either side of Aenys and Magor. So we have two different examples of pretty good effective rulers. Aegon is a conqueror who consolidates. Alisanne and Jaehaerys finish that consolidation and turn Westeros into an actual realm. They improve the laws. They improve uh, the lives of the common people. They make roads. They turn it into a cohesive nation. And in between, we see Aenys, who was afraid to use his dragon and afraid to do anything. He was dithering and indecisive, which is not something a medieval king can be. And then we see Magor, who took it to the other extreme and at times was effective, but of course, left everyone with saying, you know, is there someone else up there we can talk to? And then once Jaehaerys and Alisanne came along, backed by Rogar and Alyssa, they both have dragons. It's like, yeah, we'll take them. So, do you think Beleriand felt Magor die? I'm sure some kind of link is broken when a rider dies. Yeah, I tend to think so, Lysa, and thank you. I tend to think so. And it's interesting to note that even though um, Araya and her sister that's in Old Town at the Sept almost certainly switch identities. And so the one that rides Balerion isn't actually Araya, but Araya's sister. Um, it, Magor designates Araya as his heir, and then later Araya rides Balerion. So that's kind of interesting. It's like she did inherit his dragon, ultimately. And maybe she thought it was hers because of that. Interesting. So, going back to Kelly's question, or not Kelly's question, it was, uh, yes, it was. Aegon, uh, the wormy seed in Tyena, because that's really what this comes down to. Let me find, let me put, uh, yeah, this is the right one. So, we know that the Targaryens have reptile dna okay that's that's obvious we it's not just magor having lizard babies there's been several other accounts and even if you doubt miriam Asdor's account i would just remind you that jora was in the room with danny and miri when miriam Asdor says it was a dead lizard baby and jora doesn't go no it fucking wasn't like he he just like he's ashamed and sad about it but he doesn't contradict so danny had a lizard baby uh, one of the um, Lena's had one. Uh, one of Lena's dragons hatched. It's two, two different Lena's. One of them had a dragon hatched that was a worm. Uh, but there's been several lizard babies. So that doesn't rule out the idea that Tyena... Oh, let me remove this. Sorry. There's still a possibility that Tyena could have had a hand in this. Okay. Because it's interesting, when Danny has her lizard baby, there's a sorceress there who wishes Danny harm, who doesn't want Danny to have the stallion who mounts the world. So can sorcery turn a Targaryen pregnancy into a lizard baby? Can sorcery make the lizard genes manifest? That doesn't seem impossible. Yeah, Rhaenyra had one too, obviously, yeah. And Rhaenyra has one, there's not sorcery involved, but there is like trauma 
kind of. Like, she's in an absolute rage when it comes out, but it doesn't seem like a regular baby could just transform into a lizard baby suddenly. Maybe with magic it can. It's really hard to see. Uh, yeah, I, I thought um, uh, the acting in that scene, it was traumatizing, but it was incredible. Uh, so yeah, there's lizard babies are a thing. It's just a question of whether or not sorceress foul play can uh, accelerate or make them more likely to manifest. But with Megor having so many, I really do, it doesn't make sense to put it all on Tyana, who confessed under torture, supposedly, which means very little, right? So. Megor essentially blames everyone but himself over and over for all his problems not having kids. He can't have kids, and then he has lizard babies, miscarriages, and he blames it all on the women, either the women trying to give birth or Tyana in that one instance. Also, the, the septas and midwives are executed. So I think the way that this is written, we're supposed to assume, like, the problem is Megor. Whether or not Ty like there's not really a need for Tyana to use sorcery to cause lizard babies. Like Megor just can't have kids. And he's having nothing but lizard babies. And you know what I would guess, guys, is that without sorcery, he can't have any children at all. And what's happening is that. Tyana is giving is using magical fertility potions, as it said, fertility potion. And that fertility potion is what is causing the lizard babies, meaning that like the only viable pregnancy that Megor could create is a lizard baby, but it needs magic to help it. So probably without sorcery, he's having no children, exactly. And with these fertility potions, he is but he's only able to get these deformed lizard children. I, I'd almost guarantee you that's what George is intending uh, to write with his story. And that brings us back to Visenya and Megor's conception. So, it is said that, May, that Visenya... Look, there's a, I'll just say this. There's a lot of rumors in A Song of Ice and Fire. George loves creating rumors. He does not throw them out for no reason. A lot of them are calumnies and things, but there's always a seed of truth, okay? So we are told that Aegon the Conqueror, all of his children are suspect, okay? Visenya strongly implied that she used sorcery after she couldn't get pregnant for like 10 years or more, and then rumored to use sorcery and comes up with Magor, who's super big and strong, and grows fast and aggressive, and then can only have lizard babies with the help of sorcery. So, Megor himself seems like a magical creation. It seems that Visenya could only give birth with the aid of sorcery. And this is something we shouldn't wonder about. The Targaryens and the Valerians before them are doing incest. And it's magical incest. It doesn't have quite the same result as like the Habsburgs with the weird chins and stuff. However, we do get weird stuff. Um, there are Targaryens with deformities occasionally. And the idea that some of them might not be able to give birth, that makes sense. You know, it's like there's bound to be some side effects with all this weird magical breeding stuff. There always is. So yeah, it seems like Visenya conceived Magor with sorcery. And then Rhaenys, we're told that Rhaenys um, was hanging out with all kinds of singers and handsome princes and people. And that, you know, very likely her son, Aenys, who was so unlike Aegon, that and that part seems kind of BS, might not have been Aegon's son. Um, now, the thing is, it ultimately doesn't matter that much because Rhaenys and Visenya are just as Targaryen as Aegon. So the Targaryen line obviously continues through Rhaenys' children, who may or may not be Aegon's, um, which is interesting. But 
bottom line, it does seem like Aegon may not have been able to have children. And that Rhaenys conceived with somebody else, and that Visenya conceived with sorcery. And this Magor stuff is definitely one of the biggest clues that that is the case. Yeah, see, every Targ being a bastard, I mean, that's kind of, that fits George's commentary on paternity and bastardry and stuff. He's over and over and over pointing out the fact that it's very arbitrary. You know, this is just, these are just political terms, really. Oh, is it 420? It sure is. So we have finished, um, I guess I didn't portion these out very well. We went three and a half hours with Fae Fire last time. We did a lot of material. We were having so much fun. Fae Fire is awesome. And so today we have finished the end in about an hour. So we've got some time to do discussion and questions and things like that. I am here for you. So in the end, I think we can say, just like I said, Magor is cruel, but he's not insane. Everything that he does is not insane. He is somebody that does have an acute political mind. He does understand the use of violence uh, in a medieval society and at times effectively uses violence. Um, and other times it seems that he becomes... He self-sabotages due to his anger and rage. He does seem to have rage, and some of the most violent acts that were politically senseless, like massacring all the Haraways and all the people at Haraways Town who are distantly related to the Haraways, there's no political advantage to that. It definitely happened, and it definitely just gave him the reputation of a butcher. So the Sept of Remembrance... I pointed out that that was dishonorable because they were abiding by the terms of the trial by seven. Even still, you can make the argument that it's an effective strategic ploy because these are soldiers who have fought him and you can't really believe that all the warrior sons and faith are going to stop fighting. So he burnt them all alive. It was kind of cruel and insane, but it was also an effective blow because he took out a concentrated cluster of his you know, enemies. Um, but there are certainly other things. Like I said, a lot of the stuff with the uh, blaming his wives for everything that, that he did, you know, not being able to have kids. This stuff is where he descends into cruelty and madness. So there's, there's a bit of both. A bit of both, I would say. And you can see why some people make the argument like, well, no, nah, some of what Magor did was necessary because the faith had delegitimized the Targaryen dynasty. And that's true. Um, but obviously the way that Magor did it, and then some of the other things he did, created this backlash. So that as soon as there was an opening and another candidate, everyone rushed in uh, to fill that, that gap. And if you want to say, <clears throat> if you want to adopt Magor's cruel mindset, then you could also say, well, why did he leave Jaehaerys and Alysanne alive for so long? Why didn't he hunt them down with Balerion? Because eventually they were, he was just leaving an opponent out in the field. That, that came back to bite him, so. First time watching your stream live, I've been binging your videos for a month, I've been getting a lot of those messages and new people to the channel. Welcome, big, big myth hugs. Appreciate y'all. Wanted to say, love the content, oh yeah. This is one of the few places you will find fresh Song of Ice and Fire content in the year of our Lord 2023. I will say that, that is true. I try not to, you know, brag or whatever boast or self-promote. I don't know. I'm supposed to self-promote, but yeah, we're keeping it fresh. I'll say that. So I guess there's a lot of cool Raina stuff that comes in the next section with Jaehaerys. So, but she did steal Blackfire, guys. That's some, that's some shit. She stole Blackfire from out of the nose, under the king's nose. That's legendary stuff. And of course, Reyna, um, Dreamfire, probably laid the eggs that became Danny's. What we know for sure is that Alyssa Farman eventually stole eggs from Dragonstone, which became Danny's eggs. We know Dreamfire was there. We know Dreamfire lays eggs. We don't know which eggs Alyssa Farman stole, but it kind of would make sense if they were Reyna's.
Sure. Um, the other delicious thing about that would mean that if Alyssa Farman becomes Quaithe, which is very possible, then you have Alyssa Farman going to a shy, learning sorcery, and helping her old girlfriend Raina's descendant, Daenerys, hatch the eggs that she stole from Raina, which is an awesome historical echo, if so. So that's one of the things I really like about the idea that Alyssa Farman is Quave, is because it creates a very interesting historical parallel. Um, and it also gives potentially an emotional connection between Quave and Danny, because Danny reminds her of Raina. You know what I mean? Like that would be compelling. That way, Quave has room to become more than just a mask and a weird counselor by way of, you know, glass candle astral projection. And yeah, if you've never heard of the Alyssa Farman Quay thing, it's pretty much as simple as the fact that Alyssa Farman has been involved with dragons and Targaryens her whole life and is this really curious person who has a dream of sailing across the Sunset Sea and does, almost certainly gets to a shy. I keep saying that uh, that uh, Colloquo Votar saw her ship in a shy. That is wrong. It was Corlys Velaryon, the sea snake who supposedly saw the Sun Chaser in a shy. Colloquial Votar, although we're not sure when he lived, is older. So apologies if I've misled anyone there. It was Corliss the Sea Snake. But yes, he sees Sun Chaser in a shy, or a ship that looked like Sun Chasers. It's, I mean, again, this is a story, guys. Of course it's Sun Chaser. It's not fun if it isn't. So we should assume Alyssa got there. Now, why would Alyssa Farman be Quave? Because there's really only two people that we know of that could be Quaid, which is Alyssa Farman or Shiera Seastar. Maybe Quaid is no one, but if she's someone, those would seem to be the two seeds that have been planted. And again, um, it makes sense that someone who had a Targaryen girlfriend and who had the wonder and belief to think that there's a land across the sea, this is someone who would be interested in sorcery and, and learning anything they could, and extending their lifespan. Yeah, Sun Chaser in the Shadowlands of Ashai. There's definitely some stuff going on there. And you have to think, like, whatever the fallout was between Alyssa and Reyna at the time, Alyssa seemed mostly motivated by her desire to do her own thing. And a hundred years later or something, like, she would mostly, she would not be mad at Alyssa, or at Reyna. She would think, she would remember the good times, the best times of her life, and probably maybe even feel a little bit bad. So, I don't think that's cause for us to mistrust Quave, R.E. Danny, if she is Alyssa Farman, but but rather the opposite. No, I don't think Quave is a Shard Dane. I just don't think, I mean, I... I get. I haven't thought about that theory in a long time. Um, I guess it's possible. Ashara Dane should be somewhere. I I t- just think she's in the swamp with Halland Reed. I guess. And I really like the Shara Sea Star, is Quave theory because that creates another cool parallel where Blood Raven and Shara Sea Star, who were lovers, are now both tutoring heroes of the story. Quave tutoring Danny. Blood Raven tutoring Bran. And Melisandre might be the child of Blood Raven and Shiera, and Mel is tutoring John in a way, and resurrecting John soon. So that would be cool if this ancient magical family of Blood Raven, Shiera, and their child Mel were the three wizards that are tutoring the three heroes of the story. I, I like that symmetry, and I like the idea that it's this family of bastards. You know, Blood Raven and Shiera, both bastards, and their child, who ended up sold into slavery, Melisandre, they're the ones training the heroes. They are the Obi-Wan Kenobis. Like, I love that. So, I can't even decide between the Alyssa Farman or the um, the uh, Shiera Seastar is Quaith. But what's going to be one of those two, I have to think. And they're both delicious. So, if Quaith is nobody, I'll be upset. <laughs> Uh, 
I love Marwan the Mage too, as I always say. Oh. <clears throat> so guys, yeah, like I said, open questions, uh, PayPal, Super Chats, or just in the chat. Quaid is Danelle Lothston, Greyways Tim says. Mel is the love child of her and Blood Raven. Which queen of Hall figure? I have not heard that theory, Grey Race Tim. How, did, how does Danelle Lawson get to a shy? That's all I'm... That would be my first question. So, Septa Lamore, or Lenore, I don't think that is a Shara Dane because I just think Tyrion would notice the purple eyes and probably even recognize her. It's a Grey Waste Tim original, Tim says. I think I think um there's a theory that Septa Lenore is like Wenda the White Fawn or something like that. From the Kingswood Brotherhood. Have you ever noticed how bastard names and first men names use the same naming system? Yeah, it's true. The bastard names are taken after the land, stone, rivers, waters, yeah. Sand, snow, stone. I said stone. Septa Lamore is a Dornish agent. She certainly could be. That'd be dope. I can't tell you who Septa Lamore is. I don't have a good one. Do you think we'll get more of Quay than Winds of Winter? Yes. Check out my um, video, Glass Candle Cirrus. It's got a real sexy Danny on the front. Hard to miss. Extra voluptuous Danny, which is... Cool, I'm down with all interpretations of Danny. She's such a universal figure that she, you know, can and should be portrayed in many different ways. Uh, but, yeah, a glass candle Cirrus. <laughs> what was I talking about? Um, she's going to get a glass candle. Marwin definitely, yeah, LML having sexy Danny art. Who would have thought? I like to represent all Danny art. And I, I honestly do have... Like, I have seen people object. Like, because Danny is, you know, petite and is not super voluptuous. That is not how she is described. However, she also is, like I said, functioning as sort of a goddess figure in the story. And she means so much to so many people that you've seen all kinds of interpretations of Danny, including different ethnicities or looks. I've seen Indian Danny and Egyptian Danny, and like, I think that's all valid. So. Put them up. Oh, I've only got 500 pieces of Danny art. Let me, I'll get the glass candle Cirrus art out. Hang on a second, since I'm talking about it. It's sexy, but like intimidating, dandy. Danny. <laughs> Where is this conversation going? There she is. So, <clears throat> Glass Candle Cirrus, this video is essentially about the idea that Marwyn the Mage has just taken ship to go help Danny prepare for the end times battle. He's been using a glass candle to keep an eye on both things in the east as well as everything in the north. So, he is skilled in the use of the glass candle. He appreciates how useful it is, both for information and battle coordination. And he is the Archmaester of the Higher Mysteries, which means he has control of the Citadel's many glass candles. So he's got one in his room, which he leaves burning and, and when, he, when he takes off. But we should assume he has a glass candle carry bag and another one that he's bringing with him. Because if you're going to help Danny save the world and you have glass candles and you know how to use them, obviously you're going to friggin' bring one to Slaver's Bay so that when you get there, you can use it to communicate with people and keep an eye on what the hell's happening in Westeros. I mean, it's a 100% chance that Marwyn is bringing a glass candle to Slaver's Bay. It's insane that he wouldn't. There's just no chance. So whenever Danny gets back to Meereen and Marwyn reveals himself, he's probably in disguise, uh, he'll have a glass candle and he'll be showing her how to use it. And so I think George is setting Danny up to become more of a classic Valyrian sorceress.
meaning that she, she'll have the glass candle. She'll be more skilled in the use of magic and the dragon bond. She may even blow the dragon binder horn. I feel like I've got another one called uh, Danny dragon binder about that one. And so I think what Danny will do originally, George was going to have Danny go to a shy. And in the first couple books, Quaid is like, you got to come to a shy. There's truth in a shy truth. And then George says he abandoned that idea because it would take too long. So in order to serve that function in the story, it's pretty obvious to me that he's just going to have Danny use a glass candle to visit a shy via astral projection. Instead of Quave having to project herself to Danny, they will both have candles. They'll be able to communicate a lot better and Danny will be able to go roaming on her own and verify whatever Quave is telling her. She'll be able to go roaming around the shadow and maybe she'll be able to learn some stuff. Okay, maybe she'll see visions from the past. Contact those gemstone emperors again. That's another good theory is that she'll, she'll see the kingly ghost with the gemstone eyes again with the glass candle. Maybe they'll be able to teach her the speech of dragon kind or tell her about the comet. Because the, all that stuff in the House of the Undying is like fake Great Empire of the Dawn. And that's what they say. We can teach you the speech of dragon kind. We, can, we sent the comet to show you the way. Somebody did send the comet and somebody can teach Danny dragon magic from the past. And so it would be the great empire of the Dawn people in her vision. And I, I do think uh, she'll use a glass candle to get a hold of them and get information. So ev whatever she was going to learn in a shy via Quave, she'll learn via the glass candle. And Quave will probably be involved in that too. And I made a whole video about it, which is that. So check it out. Let's see. Let's put some Magor back up. There's one uh, that I did not use that's got Balerion. I almost used this for a cover, but I wanted to keep Magor the focus. You can see Magor here down by the jaw. So this is giant Balerion in King's Landing. Kind of love this. This is Mark Simonetti. Yeah, I probably do have enough information to do a Danny uh, iceberg. I probably do. It might not be seven hours, but yeah, I probably could do a Danny iceberg. There's a lot of Danny ideas because there's magical stuff. There's plot stuff. Yeah, it's sick artwork. Very smog-like for sure. But this is kind of how big Balerion is. He's, you know, maybe this is a little bit big, but not much. Balerion is huge. Oh, got a couple more super chats. So check those out. Jenna says, another 90s kid. Thank you, thank you. You're very welcome. Kirsty, if she didn't birth him, what went into creating Magor? Magic, alchemy, is he plant, human, clay? <laughs> so I think, good question, Kirsty. And I think the answer might be with the Tyana thing. So Magor can't have kids. But then Tyana starts using fertility potions and then he has lizard babies. So it's kind of similar thing. Well, Aegon, his seed isn't potent. They're, they're blanks. His swimmers are blanks. But if you sprinkle some magic on it, you know, basically Visenya was better at magic than Tyana. And so instead of coaxing a lizard baby out of Aegor's or out of Aegon's, um, impotent swimmers, if you will, she was able to make a Magor, who's almost human, right? Whereas Tyana of the Tower, perhaps understanding less about what she was doing with the dragon blood of the Targaryens, you know, she juiced it somewhat, but they only got lizard babies. It's probably something like that. Visenya is probably very high-level sorceress. You know, they just... There's no upper limit to what we can speculate as Visenya's sorceress knowledge and power. She is just, I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised if she knew some deep, deep stuff. 
Also, remember, they've got the prophecy to worry about. Aegon's prophecy about the long night. So Visenya and Rhaenys need to have children in order to create this bloodline that's going to fight the others. So it's not just trying to have a kid to establish their new dynasty. They literally need to create this bloodline for the prince that was promised. So after nine or ten years of not being able to have a kid, you would turn to sorcery. It's not even like this creepy, weird thing. It's like... And it's also why Rainey's might have slept with somebody else to have a kid. It's like, well, it'll be half, it'll be half my, you know, it'll be my half Targaryen. Not me and Aegon's child, but at least my child. So, yeah. Why was Megor so indecisive in dealing with Jaehaerys' rebellion? Was he in shock from his mother's death? Was she the real decision maker? Um, well, definitely she... It seems like she and Megor are of one mind until she dies. But also Megor seems to kind of go downhill as far as his sanity. He's doing more violent and cruel things and less sensible things as time goes on. So he may have really just become sort of paranoid and delusional uh, at that point. And his allies were abandoning him. So he was, there was, he didn't know what exactly to do. Uh, why didn't he just get on Balerion and start killing people? Who knows? Maybe he was poisoned. Could be. I'm in the Megor was actually pol politically incompetent camp. Yeah, there's only a few. There's only a few moves that you could say were somewhat strategic, and I tried to give him credit where we could. But ultimately, the cruelty catches up with you. So. You could say that Megor saved the Targaryen dynasty from a from Aenys's dithering in the faith, but he turned around and put the Targaryen dynasty on a course for destruction right after that. Uh, and it was only Jaehaerys and Reyna and Alyssa and Alysanne and Rogar who, re who really established the Targaryen dynasty in a way that would last for another 200 years. So I do think it's wrong to say he saved the Targaryen dynasty. Um, he did correct for some of Aenys' mistakes, but his mistakes were just as bad and left the dynasty in just as much peril as Aenys did. Um, it was only because Jaehaerys and Alysanne were there as better candidates that we, that we had a Targaryen on the throne at all. So, Because if, there, if uh, Jaehaerys and Alysanne didn't exist, then they just would have found somebody else to put on the throne. You know, like Robert's Rebellion did. It would have been something like that. Ooh, head rush. Mm. Yeah, just a reminder, um, if, uh, in all seriousness, if you partake, uh, follow at Garth the Green on Instagram, where I do uh, cannabis-related stuff. Some of it is educational. Most of it is just entertaining. So... <clears throat> So if she didn't birth him, what went into creating Magor? Yeah, magic and alchemy. Say so within the Targaryen seed is this lizard baby potential that can be activated. So I think she must have drawn on some of that strength, but without making Magor like a total lizard. But his, all his children came out lizards, so yeah. And it could be basically, okay, so... Calling Megor a mule is one thing, but there's also a Visenya gecko theory, which essentially means that instead of the idea that Visenya took Aegon's impotent seed and spiced it up, that Visenya uh, conceived Megor entirely on her own, with no input from Aegon at all. And the reason why that might be a thing is because geckos 
And other lizards do this or can do this. Females, um, the males are infertile and the females lay eggs. The females may produce male offspring, but yeah. So there is not, you don't always need two to tango in the lizard kingdom. Uh, that is, yeah, it's asexual reproduction. And of course there's, it's more commonly known for like, I don't know what I'm trying to say. Small, like multicellular organisms and stuff like that. But yeah, more, uh, they're called morning geckos. They have a unique way of reproducing called parthenogenesis. It's a type of asexual reproduction that allows morning geckos and other reptiles to reproduce without males. So let's look up uh, parthenogenesis. Not as snappy a title as Visenya the gecko. It, okay. A reproductive strategy that involves development of a female gamete sex cell without fertilization. It occurs commonly among lower plants and invertebrate animals. That's what I was saying. Aphids, ants, wasps, bees, and rarely among higher vertebrates. An egg produced parthogenetically may be either haploid, i.e. with one set of dissimilar chromosomes, or diploid i.e. with a paired set of chromosomes. Parthenogenetic species may be obligate, that is, incapable of sexual reproduction, or facultative, that is, capable of switching between partho parthenogenesis and sexual reproduction depending upon environmental conditions. Um, so essentially, that kind of fits... Magor not being able to have kids because the males among species that use parthenogenesis are parthenogenesis, parthenogenesis. The males are infertile. It's only the females that have kids. So yeah, <laughs> this, this sounds like what happened is Visenya somehow copied her chromosomes and Magor is, that's why Magor is such a freak, essentially. So there's a shout out to Minty Maelstrom, who uh, dug up some of this gecko stuff last year and got onto this. Yeah, Magor the mule theory you've heard before, but the gecko theory, this is pretty dope. So let's see here. Let's see if there's anything else that's interesting. And of course, the Targaryens being lizard babies, it makes sense that some snakes do this too, right? So it kind of like, it makes sense that you'd find traits, various reptilian weird biology traits manifesting in the Valyrians. Like that totally makes sense. So yeah, Visenya did parthenogenesis and Magor's a mule. So Visenya's a gecko. And this, a morning gecko, even, no less. <clears throat> That's dope. That's why Tyana was like, I don't know. I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Kelly Johnson says, not on topic, but I'm still mad at HBO fumbling the John Danny romance. It could have been incredibly impactful. The only time it worked for me was in the cave with John holding the candle and taking Danny's arm and showing her the cave paintings and talking about what they need to do to save the world. That was romantic. And then when they were standing on top of the cliff watching the whites attack Winterfell, both about to go kick ass, like that was hot. Uh, the rest of it did not work, yeah. I do think in the, um, I do think, uh, Lewis, if you want to just repeat your question, I'll answer it again. 
if I did or didn't already. Um, in the books, I think that John and Danny, it might be romantic, more romantic than sexual. Uh, I mean, John's going to be resurrected in some fashion. We don't know what Danny will be like when she gets there. Uh, but they share a family and a purpose and a destiny. And so I think that will be kind of the substance of their romance in the same way that Rhaegar and Lyanna had a shared destiny uh, and prophetic fate that brought them together, I think. So I think it'll be dope. I don't know how much sex they will have, but it will be a very interesting uh, relationship and very meaningful between John and Danny. So I'm looking forward to it. <clears throat> yeah, it could be more of a sibling bond and a partnership. It might not be romantic at all. It might be incredibly meaningful and deep, uh, but not necessarily romantic. I tend to think it will be, but it's not going to be the main point of it because they're both going to be trying to save the world. So the kissing will be on the way, if you will. The, um, the Mel is Blood Raven and Cher's daughter theory is from Radio Westeros. And if you go to Radio Westeros' website, they have some of their old theory essays listed out. And it's the third one, Mel, uh, Blood Raven, and Cher Sea Star. So, yeah, shout out to Yoke Boy and Lady Gwyn on that one. That's an old theory. Yes, and for the Targs, obviously they're not mutually exclusive. <laughs> Gonna mix it all up. Of course. It'd be very emotional, I think. Is John the faceless lover Danny saw in her dream? Essentially, yes. So this is another video I need to make. There are little pepperings of John in Danny's storyline and vice versa. Um, I need to go through and collect them all and show the John Danny foreshadowing. That would be a good video. Uh, Maynard James Keenan, um, or Maynard James Plum, rather, if you're, the mashup confuses me. If you're listening, add that to the list. John and Danny foreshadowings. Like, the famous one is Danny hears a wolf howling in the distance, you know, lonely and solitary in one of her dreams. Uh, she sees the blue rose growing in a chink of ice at the wall. It's an obvious one, too. The Mo Kalen video. Um, probably will need all week to finish it and I'll end up putting it out next Tuesday, not this upcoming Tuesday, but a week from Tuesday, but there's a chance I could really jam on it and get it out by like Thursday or Friday. I don't want to promise that. It's more likely to come a week from this Tuesday. It's going to be a full hour. So. One hour. It's like an hour, one hour and one minute of Moat Kalen. That's what's coming. Am I feeling in a Moat Kalen mood? Always. Always, baby. Always. Yeah, I'm having fun. It's hard. Like, I had the script at about 50 minutes and I was like, I haven't even talked about the Cranogman. So I had to put a Cranogman bit in there. And then I was like, oh yeah, there's that old Nan story about somebody that was held in a castle by cruel giants and he escaped and then the others caught him and drank his hot blood. What's that about? It sounds like the last hero escaping from Moat Kalen or something. Maybe the Night Fort. So I put that in there and it's going to be awesome. Talked about the fish people. After we do Moat Kalen, we'll do a follow-up stream or two with Tim to, to go deeper on the uh, deep ones. Jesse Sturgeon how old is Old Castle? You mean Old Town? Could it have been used as a foothold by the Great Empire in the north against the Children of the Forest? Oh, you're asking about Old Castle. Um, I don't even know where that is. Let me look. Probably not. It's probably just a name. But I'd have to look and see where it is. Old Castle, where is that? Oh. 
Okay, I cannot type today at all. This is agonizing. This is probably not even going to be on this map. It's too small. Yeah, totally is. I don't know where Old Castle is. Oh, I could just look it up in the wiki. The seat of House Lock in the north. The northern shore of the Bight. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's we're not we're just not told anything about the place. So, it's, if the Great Empire of the Dawn did anything north of the Neck, it's going to be under the ice of the Wall. There's going to be black stone, like you know, under the Wall or something like that. The Night Fort, the crypts of Winterfell, like stuff like that. David, I appreciate your Vedic Origins video. I'm Indian, and I use Danny Burning Drogo as an example all the time while explaining our funerals, because a lot of foreigners don't understand it. Yeah, the Sati tradition. That was where, that was one of the, uh, Tris, first of all, thank you, and you're welcome. That was one of the ones where it like, really struck me. I was like, this is not even debatable. This is absolutely something that George is almost directly recreating. Uh, with Danny, with Danny and Drogo, and then Danny walking into the pyre and experiencing a transformation. Yeah, and it's. I mean, I just. I hope it came across in that video, but my mind was blown just over and over doing that research. And honestly, I kind of fell in love with Vedic mythology and Indian history from doing that, and then started Mythic Concepts, where my first couple of videos are diving into. Indian mythology and history. So it's, uh, you know, in the West, you grow up with the Greek and the Norse stuff, you know, kind of shoved in your face more. And I've always known that that Vedic mythology was deep and complex. And it's almost intimidating because you hear it's so complex and weird, but it's really not. I mean, all mythology is weird, but like Vedic mythology is some of the most uh, sensible like the way it's organized makes such good sense it's so harmon harmonious um, and they really have mastered the idea that it's all conceptual you know so you've got all these different deities and they're never really seen as being um, in conflict with one another they're just different sort of paths that you can follow uh, so I really appreciate that aspect of it as well but yeah that was one of my favorite videos that I've ever made for sure and just really increased my appreciation for George that again he's not just using your classic western mythology that we're all familiar with uh, but diving into Indian mythology Iranian mythology we found some Japanese and Chinese folklore as well so that's pretty dope we like it because I do think George is educating us here and that's really what I'm trying to facilitate is that layer of uh, stuff that he's put in the books for us to find and hopefully, you know, learn more about. So throw me a couple more questions. Oh, the night for <laughs> Jesse that is a good way to keep me on for 10 more minutes. So yeah, the Night Fort has to predate the wall. It's it's said to be the oldest castle on the wall, which doesn't really specify if it was before or after the wall, just said it was the oldest castle. But if you think about it, the Weirwoods are eternal. The Night Fort Weirwood is very unique because it's got the talking face. Maybe other ones have that, we don't know. But we know the Night Fort does. It's got a Weirwood sproutling up top, and it's got a talking face and a tunnel down below, way down below. So it's a huge organism. The first men very obviously built their oldest castles around the Weirwoods. They did not build a castle, leave a green area in the middle, call it a godswood, and then plant a Weirwood. They went to places where there were already ancient Weirwood groves, and they build castles surrounding them, and then they put magic wards on them. Storm's End is warded. Winterfell is almost surely warded. The Night Fort is warded. Blood Raven's Cave is warded. These are all shadow wards. 
So you could see the path. The first men, with the help of the children, probably right after the long night or during the long night even, but most likely right after, built castles around the weirwoods to keep watch over them. Um, you might even think that maybe the others can use them if they're not protected with spells or something like that. We'll get, that's a different idea. So when you get back to the night for it, it's obvious that the weirwood comes first. The castle comes next. And then you look at the location that they chose to build the wall. Well, if the weirwood is the oldest thing there, it's pretty obvious that it dictated the location of the wall, meaning that the weirwood magic was almost certainly used to raise the wall and that probably other places along the wall will find other weirwood organisms. And it was probably the power of these weirwood organisms somehow that was used to create, if it wasn't the ice of the wall, at least the spells, the warding spells that prevent the shadows from passing. So you can sort of see, like, first comes the weirwood, then the Nightford Castle, and then the wall built out from there. Also, if you're building the wall, like, you need a base of operations to work from. So that was probably the night fort. And uh, going further, I've, you know, I believe the night fort was where there was an original green man watch, just like the, the green men on the Isle of Faces that watch over the weirwoods there. And it is from that watch that the night's watch was created. So check out green men of the night fort. It's a live stream, but it's like a detailed theory live stream. So. Yeah, those night fort, um, the steps at the night fort, there are steps carved into the wall, but they're literally carved into the ice of the wall and they've all melted and smoothed over and Mira climbs up them. It's the most like terrifying thing. I try, I just skip over it. I try not to think about it. Mariah, I can't even, it's too terrifying. So Jorah the Explorer, yeah, this is what I think too lately that the God's Woods are designed to contain the others who can, in fact, travel through the Weirwood Net. They're killing jars um, that became holy due to the forgetfulness of the ages. Yes. And if the wards aren't... That's why there has to be a Stark in Winterfell. That's why the Weirwoods have to be watered with blood, because that blood strengthens those wards. So if there's no Stark in Winterfell, and you remember Ned washes his bloody sword off in the pond... So even though he's not sacrificing people, this is a ritual tradition of the Starks to wash their execution swords in the pond, thereby they have been offering blood to the Weirwoods all these years. And if you go back longer, they actually were offering captives to the Weirwood in Bran's vision. And I don't even know that that captive in Bran's vision is anyone in particular. I think it's just to show us that this was an old ritual of the Starks. Maybe that's cold hands, I don't know. But I just think the point is... um that they've been doing that. And so offering blood to the weirwoods, I think probably strengthens those wards and without a Stark in Winterfell, without the wards being strengthened, eventually when the wall comes down, I do believe the others will start teleporting out of the weirwood trees in the God's woods. Uh, and it'll be terrifying. And those, of course, that's also in the ice spiders video. So check that out. Another awesomely entertaining stream. Thank you. No problem. Amanda of House Robinson, four months squish member. Dragons can go to Winterfell but not past the wall, it seems. Yeah, so I don't, I don't think Winterfell is coated in that otherish ice magic. But it could be that the dragons just don't like the wall. But we'll see. It amounts to the same thing doesn't it? Will Val be John's consolation prize since he won't end up with Daenerys? Um, I don't know, Kelly Johnson. I see John... I see Danny with a magical, heroic, self-sacrificial death, and I think John will become the new Cold Hands. I don't think either one of them get to be happy. I think John will be roaming by himself. I do not think he will marry Val... And have that kind of ending. No, I do not think so. I just don't think that's... The thing about the self-sacrifice is if you don't pay the price, it's not as meaningful. John and Danny will be giving all of themselves to save the world. They will not then be handed everything back. 
that they sacrificed. That's why it's a sacrifice. That's why they are tragic heroes. In my, that's how I think it's going to go anyway. Thanks, Devil Deep. Appreciate that. How did Danny take her dragons beyond the wall in the Game of Thrones? Uh, well, so in the show, Cheryl, they did not work with that idea that the dragons uh, were stopped by the wall. George wrote Fire and Blood, or at least released that bit, right after that season. And some people thought that George was specifically trying to correct the record. But it's really just a difference between the show and the book. Magic rules, if you will. It just wasn't an issue on the show. <clears throat> it's called bad writing. I was trying to be polite, great ways, Tim. The entire white hunt thing was kind of weird. But the, the idea of dragons flying over the wall, I mean, they didn't really, it's like the dragon flame didn't melt the Night's King. We never got to see if dragon fire melted the others. So the entire ice versus fire thing was not something that Dave and Dan really were working with or understood. I just, they weren't a fan of that. John didn't even get a flaming sword, guys. There was no Azor a High Reborn. Like, they didn't do anything about that. Could dragons enter the city of Yin? I don't see why not. I don't see why not. Um, I mean, because, yeah, the dragons, there's dragons in Ashai, and Ashai is made of oily stone. I think that, so it could be that the dragons don't fly over the wall because it's literally coated in ice magic. Or it could be that the spells that stop the others also stop the dragons because they're magical beings. I tend to think it's the ice magic itself that is inimical to the dragons. And I think George is showing us that the thing the show got right is that the cold winds of the others will dismay the dragons. We've seen the dragons don't even like storms and rain. They get grounded in certain battles and they fight on the ground um, because there's a lot of wind and rain. So against the others, if they're bringing cold winds and stuff, we should expect the dragons to be dismayed by that. And of course, because otherwise it's too one-sided of a fight. They just swoop in and melt the others and that's it, right? So... It should be a struggle. Owen Bush, Bowen Marsh. Bowen Marsh should die with his genitals in his mouth, shouldn't he? That'd be sick. It'd be both sick, gross, and sick as in like metal as fuck. Yeah, at the last storm, Meraxes fought in the mud. There's some other examples too. The wall stops spirits and shadows and the dragons are inhabited by spirits. Good point, C-Bob. That is my theory and other people's theory that there are Valerian ancestor ghosts in the dragons. So that is perhaps why that they would be stopped by the shadow wards. Good point. Good point. Craster. So Craster is said to be the child of uh, a crow flown down from the wall and a woman from White Tree. So... It's mostly the symbolism that makes us think that that crow was either Aemon or Bloodraven. Because all the Night's King figures should be Azor High figures and the others should be f like frozen dragon spawn. Um, and then, of course, Nissa Nissa being a child of the forest, she's Weirwood aligned. So the archetypal pairing is Dragon Lord Azor High and Nissa Nissa of the Weirwood. And. In death, it seems that there is a version of Nissa Nissa that becomes Knight's Queen and takes Azor High's seed. I forget which hand is who, but and makes the other. So I've talked about this a million times. So yeah, White Tree has a huge weirwood. It's got the baby in the mouth. So it's very important weirwood, the, the baby skeleton in the mouth that's in, talking about sacrifice to the weirwoods and possibly the others. So to me, yeah, uh, Craster makes the most sense if he is either Aemon or Bloodraven's son. I very much uh, hope that we get more evidence for that. Do we know what Danny's dragons are supposed to look like? I mean, just the colors. 
you know, we know they have two legs and two wings, but other than that, no. <laughs> the flame does match the color of the, the scales to some extent, yes. I tend to think it would be Blood Raven and not Aemon. No, no, Aemon rather. Is it Aemon who talks about holding a child in your arms or something like that? I think it's Aemon's line that that's a clue that he did once hold a child in his arms but have to give it up. Yeah, this is the Mark Simonetti artwork on the bottom. And on the top, this is Bastien Le Couf de Arm with the, uh, with the Magor. So it's Eamon who talks about the feel of a son in your arms. Right. So that would indicate that it would be Maester Eamon's kid. Of course, I could totally see blood. It sounds cold hearted, though, like something Blood Raven would do. You know, like have a kid with a wildling and then being like, sorry. Can't. That's your your responsibility now. Like that's kind of messed up. So if Eamon did it, it would be heartbreaking to him. And that's the context in which he speaks those words. If Blood Raven did it, it's a little bit different spin. Because Blood Raven's kind of a cold bastard. We saw that. I mean, Maynard Plum is ice cold, dude. Icy. Icy cold Maynard Plum. Right from the jump, he's just not afraid to. Everything he says is offensive, but mostly true, but like a little over the top. <clears throat> Blood Raven is a deadbeat dad confirmed. <laughs> I mean, and if Melisandre is his kid, then also, yeah, he didn't do nothing there. Of course, I think that it would have been Shiera taking Mel and probably fleeing to the east. So Blood Ravens probably didn't even have a choice in that one. Because it it's made clear that Shiera never went along with what, you know, Blood Raven wanted them to marry and she never would. So it's like, she did what she wanted. Who's the OG Jon Snow in some ways? Are you talking about Maester Aemon? Oh, that's interesting. Hmm, Okay. That would explain why she disappears from the story. Exactly. Shara Seastar does just disappear. So where does she go? She doesn't just, you know what I mean? She's somewhere. Mel being only 150. Oh, I don't know. I don't, I think you stop counting somewhere after like 80 years of wizard training. I mean, really. The idea that she's 400 is only from the show. That is not book canon. I do think she's older than she looks, but she does not have to be 400. And I do hope that John's name is Eamon. <laughs> what do you think of a romancing the stone 80s movie reference? Kelly Johnson. Very nice. Adventure of John and Danny going to retrieve ancient mag magic artifacts from the mazes of the maze makers. It would be from the heart of winter. And it won't feel quite like romancing the stone, but that is a great reference, Kelly Johnson. That was sick. That's a good 80s movie to watch. If, if you don't mind a little 80s style, you know, chauvinism. Romantic chauvinism. What role will the 200 remaining giants play in the books? Are there really 200? That's an interesting question. We should probably get them on the right side of the wall so they don't turn into giant whites, huh? Do you think Maester Eamon knew John, who John was as he always touching his face? Um, Cheryl Baxter, that's a good question. I don't think so. Because I think... That's, I'll have to think about that. My initial instinct is that no, because at the end of his life, he's bemoaning that Danny is out there and uh, Targaryen alone in the world and blah, blah, blah. And he wishes he was younger so he could go to her. If he knew Jon was a Targaryen, he would have been treating him differently. Like he would have been, they would have been talking about it. 
So I wonder if maybe he suspected or was just like, ah, oh, these features feel familiar or something like that, maybe. But yeah, John also is said to have the stark look. Good point. I think the connection was more intuitive than conscious, Lunk the Lunk says. The Giants were headed to hard home. Um, Chase, I think that sounds right. Jenny of Oldstones, what are you trying to say? Um, the Valerians were doing the blood magic, but slaves, to make blood bonds, they use royal baby boys. Um, are you talking about like the original dragon bonds? Yes. To create the dragon bond, the whole point of lemur theory is that you need an ancestor of the people who want to ride dragons. So you've got to kill Grandpa Valerian, Grandpa Targaryen, so that his children could bond with the dragon and ride the dragon. So yeah. The slaves were probably sacrificed to make like Valerian steel and stuff like that. Somebody was bagging on me for how I say Valerian. Because sometimes I say Valerian. On the show they mostly say Valir. Valerian. But a lot of times I say Valerian. Valeria. I don't know why I do that. But I think I do both. So if that annoys you, I'm sorry. <laughs> don't shoot. I don't, it's not on purpose. <clears throat> when I said Vagar for that one video, that was on purpose. I was messing with y'all for sure. <laughs> All right. Well, I will take last call for questions and then probably bounce out of here. Be a short stream today. Short, relatively. Two hours instead of four. Mager, Mager the Cruel. Yeah, that old Mager the Cruel, man. I tell you. Cruel son of a bitch, that Mager. Pronounce words wrong to boost engagement in the comments. Jacob. Yeah, that Vagar video got a lot of comments. Yes, it did. <laughs> Valerian. Valerian. Yeah, maybe that's what it is. Valerian. Valerian. When I use when I speak of House Valarion of the seahorse, I say Valarion to distinct. So even if, if I say Valerian, Valarion is different, and it's more English sounding, and that's how they say it on the show, Valarion. So, <laughs> what do you think is the end game for John and Danny Saturnine? I did a stream called Journey to the Heart of Winter, and that is essentially it's going to be. A better version of Sam and Frodo. Okay, so Sam and Frodo go behind enemy lines to do a magical deed in Mordor. Mordor. While the armies are fighting, the armies of men are fighting the armies of demons at the gates of Mordor. So I think you'll have a similar thing where the others are advancing, fighting at Winterfell, maybe further south, but behind the lines are John and Danny, guided by Bran to do magical shit at the heart of winter. That is the short answer. Danny's Destiny also, uh, check out Born to Burn the Others, very clearly spelled out as an abolition movement where the whites are the final incarnation of the slaves that she keeps trying to free and freeing throughout her story. She's always trying to protect people, free slaves. She likes to burn slave masters. She's going to do more of that. The, the, the others are slave masters of the whites in a sense. So her final act will be something with the Weirwoods in the heart of winter that will free all the whites from bondage. That is what I know. I'm not sure what exactly that is. It could just be literally melting a big frozen friggin' Weirwood tree or something. I'm not sure how George is going to write that. It could be stuff in the astral realm that's all visionary. I don't know. But somehow, she will definitely set the whites free with magic, and that'll probably be her final act. And check out Born to Burn the Others there. Thank you, Wee Lad Gimli. And then the other thing I will say is like the foreshadowing for what Danny's going to do is Stannis. Stannis is trying to take the throne because he's king. Then he realizes he needs to go and do the duty of king. So he backs off from King's Landing, hears about a threat in the north, goes north and helps the Night's Watch. That's what Danny's going to do. She'll have some level of interaction with, with taking King's Landing, 
Fagon, whatever, it'll probably go bad, tragic in some way, and then Danny's going to hear about this threat from the north and realize that to protect the people of Westeros, which is what her real heart's desire is, she needs to go north and fight the others instead of fighting for the throne. So that'll be a major turning point in her story, obviously. I say obviously, it wasn't obvious to Dave and Dan, who had her beat the others on the, on the way to going crazy. Um, that's just a side quest. That's interesting. <laughs> I think the big bad of wins is Euron and they all got to kill Euron. Well, yes. The only question is how much will Euron's big bad status overlap with the threat of the others? Will he accidentally cause the long night? Will he intentionally cause it? Will he try to take power of the others and whites and command them? Will he get body snatched by the great other and become Night King that way? Or will he just be a parallel magical threat that's operating at the same time? I'm not sure, but I've speculated on how those could all play out um, in my two year on videos. I don't think George will need four books. I think he is going to do it in two books. And the big clue is that he's already written 11 or 1200 words for wins as of four or five months ago. That's the same amount of words that he's written for dance. So he's written enough words for wins as he has for entire Dance with Dragons, but he still isn't finished. So basically he's writing wins until he gets to a plot ending and that's when it will be finished. So probably it will have to be bound in two volumes because Dance, Dance with Dragons is about as big as a bound book could be. Not words, pages. I always say words, I mean pages. He's up, yeah, 1,100 words. That's nothing. 1,100 pages, guys. That's about the length of dance. He has said that he's not going to do a split like he did last time where he splits the POVs or anything like that. So wins will come out at once. I'm almost sure of it. But I'm also thinking that it's going to have to be two separate volumes that comes as one, okay? If he was going to do more than two books... He would just find a shorter place to end wins, chop that material and just keep leaving it. You know what I mean? And just like do as many book size chunks of work as he needs to finish the story. But the fact that he's writing wins until he gets to probably the fall of the long night, however many pages it is, that indicates to me that he is bent on doing this into books wins and dance, even if they are, you know, two volumes or one volume books, whichever it will be. Because if you think about his time left, like mentally, he probably doesn't want to write three more books. Like he's been thinking about two for a long time. He's almost done with wins. He wants to have only one more book to write. I'm sure. So yeah, it'll be two more, but they'll be huge. Huge. And I think that's the right call to write to the ending of this, the plot that you need as opposed to cutting off stuff. <clears throat> cool. Thank you, Kirsty. I'll check that out. And thank you, Sarah, who just joined Patreon. Several people joined Patreon recently. There was Nikki also. And. Yeah, somebody else from a week before, too. DM Collins, when Danny frees the whites, will they just lay down and be dead, or will they join her army like the Unsullied did? Maybe they'll just climb on down into the tombs of Winterfell and bury themselves. <laughs> so, the idea that Danny. This is a great question. So, Danny doesn't just free the slaves, she then becomes their leader, right? So how would that work with the whites? Well, maybe she, the thing is, if she started leading the whites around in war, that would be just as bad as the Night King. The way that I think this will work out is that Danny will lead the whites into the afterlife. And this, will, this is why it'll be her final act. And there's specific foreshadowing of this in The Undying. But basically, her death 
will be a magical death that works this magic that frees them. And so she will be their leader, essentially escorting their souls to the afterlife, leading them to a land where they can be peaceful. So, yeah, and it also has to do with like all the Rolora stuff about like, well, the, you burn people, it purifies them and their souls rise, you know, freed of more of their mortal bondage. That's true for the Ice Whites, like burning them, you know, probably will release their souls. So, no, John will be a new Knights King for a little bit while the others steal his body, but he'll get his body back. He's not going to end the story as a Knights King. And I will now take a last, last call for questions. So, baby, um, I made videos about this. Check out um, uh, Lord Snow. The others will steal John's body. And then specifically for how Melisandre will help to free John, check out, there's two videos. So there's a longer live stream called Searching for Azor High, and that's a reread of Melisandre's POV chapter. And then there's uh, a sh there's the one with Corrin Halfhand, where John, uh, Corrin Halfhand's death does a lot of foreshadowing for John's death and resurrection. And I... So check out that chapter reread, but I also made a short video that I pulled out of that chapter reread. And that one is called, let's see if I can. I don't remember the names of all my videos. If I'm honest. All right, content. Mel's final act. That is the one. And that did pretty well, actually. Um, uh, oh, no, it was Azor High on the Weirwood Net that did well. But Mel's final act is a cool video. And it's 22 minutes. And it will explain what Mel could or probably will do to free John's body from bondage. And also, baby, if you haven't seen the Melisandre Secrets 5 video series, I, you'd probably like that. The last two, last three really get into like what Melisandre is becoming, what the purpose is, all the different magical things that her art could climax with. And there could be some incredible stuff, some Obi-Wan parallels where she becomes a fire spirit that can give John advice, manifest at, at, at need, but not have a physical body, something like that. So yeah, check out the um, Melisandre Secret series and that's in a playlist that you can find on our front page. She could turn into Hands of White Fire Lady uh, in Euron's vision, but that would be a long way down the road. I tend to think it won't be Mel. Because I think Mel's got, I think Mel is too good at identifying. I just don't think she'll be fooled into thinking that Euron is someone she would want to help. I think she's smarter than that. Cool, guys. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. This has been Magor the Cruel. Yes, he was cruel. Probably some of it was exaggerated, but that's the kind of thing that happens when you do some cruel stuff is that you get blamed for other stuff. So in the end, I think it's mostly a commentary on sort of medieval barbaric rulers and stuff like that. And I think we covered that ground pretty effectively. Appreciate the perspective of... of uh, Faye Fire last week. That was fun. And uh, yeah, don't uh, don't go saying things like Magor did nothing wrong because he did. Hashtag Lord Haraway's town is all I got to say. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of interesting topics that were touched on here. So very fascinating story. And uh, 
Yeah, uh, we'll we'll do the conquest. The Jahari stuff is interesting. I mean, you know, Fire and Blood really is great, but you just have to break it down and just read little bits at a time. You can't plow through the whole thing. It's too dense. So, all right, guys, thanks a lot. And I'll see you. When will I see you next? I probably will end up doing a Friday and a Sunday stream this week, but I can't swear to that. So stay tuned. I'm mostly going to work on trying to finish the Moat Kalen video. So depending on how that's going and how I'm feeling, I may or may not do a Friday stream, but I definitely will do a Sunday stream. So see you next Sunday, if nothing else, but make sure you're subscribed. Make sure you download the YouTube app on your phone and make sure your phone YouTube app is set notifications turned on. That way, when I go live, your phone will be like, hey, David Lightbringer's going live. So it's upside down, but whatever. It'll still tell you. So that's it, guys. Cheers. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday.